Right. Um, well, welcome, everybody. Apologies for absence. We've got Wendy, I'm afraid, has got um, a problem at home. Um, Joanne has got flu, and Michelle is away. So we've got three apologies for absence today. Um, any declarations of interest that, any, that anyone needs to raise? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I work with a company in Science of Health that also advises pharmaceutical companies. Okay. Thanks, Richard. Um, are people happy with the minutes? I wasn't here, so I, I'm neither happy nor unhappy with them. Um, okay. So we can approve the minutes, please. So my report, I think I'd just like to say two things at the beginning. One is, is, is a a day that we are going to be saying goodbye to, um, to Jane, Moira and Victor, who will be standing down. And I think there's, a, there's a, an occasion this evening when we can say, or other, some people can say more about all three of you, but maybe just on Jane's. Jane, I think you've been in the NHS for 40 years. Nearly, yes. Um, so that is a remarkable contribution to the NHS. So thank you very much for that. That's fantastic. And to, to Moira and Victor, I'm going to say a few more words about Victor at the end because Victor's not coming to the dinner this evening. But I know, um, Maura, you're going to the dinner this evening, I think. And, and <laughs> you really don't have to. So thank you to all, all three of you for the contribution you've made. And then just um, for me, this is my first meeting. Uh, just to say that this is a, it's a huge privilege to be chairman of the NHS England. It's, um, the NHS is such an important institution for the whole country, and to be a part of it is a fantastic... Um, well, privilege and opportunity for me, so I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. So that's what I'm going to say by way of my report. Um, Simon, how about you? Thanks, David. Um, so three things, really. Uh, since we last had a public board meeting, we've had the budget, and in that the Chancellor, as you know, confirmed the £20.5 billion pounds revenue increase for NHS England by 23-24 that uh, was set out uh, back in June. As part of that, he also uh, confirmed that we would continue with the mental health investment guarantee for the next five years, whereby mental health spending will go up as a share of NHS funding over that period. And last week, uh, I accompanied the Prime Minister to a visit to community health services in North London, where she set out a similar commitment for primary medical and community health services spending. So those are two financial guardrails that are shaping the final stages of producing the NHS long-term plan. Uh, excellent work has been done on that by the many uh, working groups, uh, patients groups, uh, frontline uh, leaders across the National Health Service. Uh, the uh, day that uh, it is published uh, will uh, depend somewhat on uh, timings of other uh, public business uh, linked to Brexit, but we intend that it will be published sometime between the 12th and the 21st of December, uh, and it is uh, pretty nearly uh, ready to go. And then uh, related to that, of course, finally, uh, I was with uh, Matt Hancock and others uh, giving evidence yesterday to Parliament about NHS uh, and Brexit. And we've got a lot of work being led by the Department of Health and Social Care uh, on preparation in the event that <coughs> there is not a agreed deal uh, by 11 p.m. on March 29th. The particular issue uh, for the NHS uh, arises in connection with supply chains and uh, transportation and logistics. So we are advising uh, the Department of Health and Social Care on those aspects. Uh, where, for clinical or other reasons, uh, special arrangements will be needed. As I said to Parliament yesterday, uh, if by uh, Christmas uh, we do not have certainty that a no-deal outcome is going to be avoided, then a number of those contingency plans will need to be put into place. And I particularly want to thank our pharmacy team and medical uh, directorate for the work they're doing with the Department of Health and Social Care on that. 
and working with NHS Improvement, trusts are uh, completing their assessment around their supply chain and contracts by the 30th of November, and we will then use the first 10 days of December to assess uh, what that means for the contingency plans that need enacting. So those were the three things I was going to report on, David, the uh, budget, the long-term plan, and Brexit preparation. Other items are covered on our agenda. Any, any questions for Simon on any of those three items? I mean, maybe I can ask you one question, um, Simon. This is an unwelcome departure from established uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, practice, uh, your predecessor. <laughs> yes, Chairman. Uh, <laughs> I, I'd just be interested to, um, to get your reflections, because you, when you produced a five-year forward view, you know, four years ago now, I think, the sort of the difference between how you see the, the five-year forward view that you did then with the... 10-year forward view that you're doing. I mean, not, not just the obvious difference between five years and 10 years, but just in terms of in the journey towards sure. um, reshaping the, the way we deliver healthcare in the UK. How, how would you sort of set those two? Well, I think there are two big differences. One is that at the time the NHS constructed the five-year forward view in October 2014, we were obviously coming out of a period where there'd been a lot of time and attention tied up with the 2012 legislation rather than a focus on actually how care needed to change and so the forward view was really a uh, moment to take stock and say actually the NHS is going to have to look quite different for the following reasons and behave and work in different ways uh, and so it set an agenda as to why change was needed. Uh, what we're now doing is getting much more granular about the what and the how. Yeah. And the second big difference is that at the time the uh, forward view was uh, drawn up, we were doing that not knowing what the funding envelope would look like for the following five years, whereas we have made our argument uh, in connection with the run-up to the 70th anniversary of the NHS, have got our five-year funding settlement, and now on the back of that are able to <coughs> tackle off accordingly, with a couple of caveats, uh, important caveats, uh, particularly linked to the fact that obviously the NHS long-term plan was never expected to and cannot answer definitively the question around workforce training uh, because as uh, the Secretary of State said yesterday, the Health and Social Care Committee, that's obviously going to be the HEE budget, it's going to be set as part of the spending review, ditto for uh, capital and local authority public health grants and indeed for adult social care. So there are still a number of very important things that will have to be got right uh, during the course of 2019, uh, but in terms of the revenue funding envelope for the NHS, we have that certainty now, which we did not have when the forward view was established. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Laura. Can I ask, just in that same reflective mood that you're in, David, since I'm not going to be here at the next board meeting, but just to ask Simon how he thinks the relationship with social care has developed over that same period, really, and how he would... Um, describe it now and going forward? Well, I think in some ways similar to the increasing focus on mental health, the social care debate has come up the national agenda and I think you now can't have a conversation about the future sustainability of the NHS without also recognising the interdependency uh, with social care. Uh, some people say that that's too reductionist in that social care is not just about its interface with the NHS and that's clearly right. Uh, but uh, equally, part of what's created such salience and urgency is the fact that people can see that for uh, particularly frail older people, uh, without that uh, home-based support, uh, pressure piles into uh, expensive uh, and overheated parts of the uh, system, namely acute hospitals, and that in turn means it's harder to provide quick uh, emergency care and to do the planned waiting list work that people also want to see. So I think the kind of interconnectedness argument has moved a long way over the course of that four or five years. Obviously what has not moved uh, is a settled national consensus about a durable future funding uh, answer for uh, social care services. Uh, the government is uh, intending, uh, I believe, to publish a green paper uh, on the same sort of timeline, uh, so we're told, as the uh, long-term plan, uh, but that will be a green paper. Good. Any any other any questions? Okay. Thanks very much, Simon. Um, Emily, 
um, freedom to speak up. Yes. So I will um, checking which microphone I should be speaking in. Um, I will just do a brief summary on the paper that came second, which is the Freedom to Speak Up Inside NHS England, and then hand over to um, Henrietta, who has joined us at the end of the table um, from the, the National Guardian to talk about the work across the NHS. So in NHS England, as discussed at the board meeting last year, um, given our size of organisation, we, we should have one um, Freedom to Speak Up Guardian at least, and in discussion with the organisation we decided to go much bigger than that and to say that we should have as many broadly as wanted to come forward who were appropriately qualified to do the role. Um, and we made a commitment to do that last year. We have appointed 40 um, Freedom to Speak Up Guardians and we, in order to make sure as many locations as possible were covered, we split that into lead guardians and then support guardians where um, there was a there was a, a slightly lower time commitment required and um, experience required to do the role. We also made a commitment that one third of those would be from a BME background, which we achieved. Um, and that network uh, was established by the end of last year and we've been doing several things to try and set people up to do that role effectively. Um, one was obviously making sure the recruitment process um, was managed well and had as much um, attention in the organisation as required. We did a lot of training um, where we had great support from um, the National Guardian's Office to do so. Um, and then we've been asking the network to regularly feedback about what else they need. Um, and there have been two things that they've regularly asked for. One is further guidance um, post the training to support their work, to really help them think about how to have um, conversations, how best to support colleagues who come forward. Um, one is to differentiate, is this a freedom to speak up case or not, um, and to help guide colleagues to the right support that's available. Um, and then the, the second area is just making sure there's appropriate material for staff about when they should approach um, a Freedom to Speak Up Guardian, who, who they are, how to get hold of them, etc. So we've been looking at that during the year. We have quarterly um, workshop meetings where um, some people come in person and, and other people dial in so to review how everybody's doing their role, how they're finding it and the kind of cases that are coming up and what support's required. And then there's also a, a call every two weeks for people to dial in too so they can get immediate help and support if they need it. Um, during the year, we've had a few people change roles and say that they don't feel able to keep playing the role given their new responsibilities. As I mentioned earlier, we don't really need to appoint anybody else just by numbers. But what we found through having this larger network is that it's actually very helpful for colleagues to have guardians immediately accessible um, in each geography. So we're doing, given we have multiple office locations nationally, we've been, uh, we're currently doing a review to see should we actually fill some of those gaps or should we um, just ask the existing network to cover those areas. Um, one of our commitments last year was to think about the Freedom to Speak Up challenges in primary care, which I know um, Henrietta is going to say a bit more about in her paper. So I should just say that the important characteristics are that here are that there isn't a single um, appropriate model for primary care because there's so many different ways in which this is delivered. So one of the critical things here is to make sure people have the guidance to help ta tailor the Freedom to Speak Up approach and experience um, for colleagues. Um, but what we have done in the meantime is to work with um, Health Education England to develop an e-learning programme which um, raises awareness of the Freedom to Speak Up opportunity for staff in primary care in advance of having the model completely worked through, which um, Henrietta will update on further. So we're doing a formal review now to look at the first 12 months of Freedom to Speak Up inside NHS England. We're giving feedback to the National Guardian's Office about how training can be further adapted, in particular putting practical case studies in outside of the provider setting to help people understand what kind of cases might come up and what they need to handle, and continuing communications to make sure colleagues know how to access this, because I think that's probably the biggest gap right now. Some places very clear, other places less so. Um, so that's the update from NHS England, and I wanted to hand over to Henrietta to talk about the national initiatives. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, since I last attended this board, there have been substantial changes to the speaking up landscape across England. And uh, we've now, uh, in addition to the guardians and champions you have at NHS England, um, we've got over 800 guardians and champions and ambassadors across the country in the trusts, in the arm's length bodies, and in independent sector providers, and also in a university. Um, we've had over 12,000 cases raised to date, um, and the largest group of those is around bullying and harassment. Um, we've 
uh, as Emily said, we have uh, provided training and development for guardians, um, but also in, an, in conjunction with NHS Improvement, uh, board guidance documents so that boards are aware of their responsibilities in this space. Um, we've recently published our 2018 survey, and what this shows is that 40% of guardians don't have any protected time, um, and this impacts on their ability to do the, the role justice. Um, but it also, from the results of the perceptions of guardians, it appears uh, once again that the better organisations, as rated by the CQC, appear to do speaking up better. Um, but we want organisations to use speaking up as a way of improving. As they say at West Suffolk, freedom to speak up, freedom to improve. And I think that's a very good motto to see this as an opportunity for the ideas, the, the concerns, but also um, the, the issues that staff are facing on a daily basis to be brought to the attention of the organisation so that positive changes can be made, not only for the working lives of staff, but more importantly for patient care. Um, we've recently completed a 12-month pilot of our case review process and we're evaluating that so that we can develop a system of case reviews that should be uh, broader but also um, more rapidly uh, completed. Um, and through the case reviews we're identifying and systematically tackling the barriers to speaking up and some examples of those are conflicts of interest and conflicts of loyalty, um, the way that settlement agreements are written, a bias in the way that uh, investigations are done and also around bullying and harassment. So uh, what we do is we make the recommendations to the trust but we also expect every trust in the country to read the reports, identify the areas that they can improve on by doing a gap analysis and thereby using those recommendations to support their own improvement as well. And we've got some special projects that we're doing in partnership at the moment, including one on bullying and harassment with the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh, who've done some really groundbreaking work on this, where we've brought together 20 organisations to form an alliance, which is not only about doctors, this is much broader than about doctors, but it's also recognising that this is a four-nation issue. Uh, we're doing some work on settlement agreements with NHS employers, with some law firms, but also NHS improvement in the Department of Health, so that we can ensure that you don't require to have a law degree to understand what's written in your settlement agreement, because we've seen this has been a barrier to people being able to raise concerns about patient safety, because it appears that they're not entitled to do so under the terms of their agreement. Um, and with NHS England, we're also um, contributing to the work that you're doing about conflicts of interest. Um, in one of the case reviews we did, um, out of a staff of 9,000 in a trust, only one person had completed a conflicts of interest declaration. And we believe there's substantial improvement that can happen across the country, particularly in trusts where there are lots of um, relationships and uh, undisclosed conflicts of interest which can affect people's confidence that they will get a fair hearing or that an infer a fair investigation will be done. Um, and as Emily said, our future priorities are in terms of expanding into primary care. We're already working with some vanguard organisations, including um, a local medical committee, uh, a commissioning support unit and its associated CCGs, um, some large GP providers, and also the defence medical services. We want to look at different models in the way that this can be done, recognising that there are different relationships in different parts of the country, um, and so realising that there won't be a one-size-fits-all, but there'll be some learning that we can get from the vanguards and we're obviously adapting the training that we're doing so that it matches the needs of each of those vanguard organisations. Uh, we're very mindful of the changes in the regional structure of NHS England and NHS Improvement and we're looking to match our region so that they um, mirror your footprint and to have a, a regional liaison uh, manager in each region to create an integrated approach to speaking up across the whole patient pathway, hopefully trying to break down some of those organisational barriers between primary and secondary care, community and potentially into social care as well so that we can actually start getting some of those problems resolved. Uh, we're also developing phase two of the case review process, as I mentioned. Um, we're collecting a library of case studies, and I think it's very valuable you know, to, to consider the cases that will be relevant to organisations that aren't providing care. Um, and so really, my sort of ask of the board is to um, you know, offer you, you the annual report for this year uh, to be able to seek your feedback on that, to thank you for the funding to extend into primary care, um, for you to continue role modelling good practice by having your own guardians, um, and also just to ask me how we can help you uh, uh, get your um, 
the, the future that you want to see in terms of internally within NHS England, but also your work out into the healthcare system. Um, thank you very much, Henry. How do we know, or how do you know, that you're making a difference? Well, I think there are the feedback from the individuals who've been supported by guardians is probably the most important thing. And very much uh, considering the aspects of our role is the listening to individuals. So from the case reviews, from the interactions they have with guardians, it's not uncommon for people to say, this is the first time I felt truly listened to. So I'm looking at it from the, 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 the sort of micro on the, the effect on the individual. And then when we look at the effect that it has on organisations, so when people are reading the case reviews and immediately making improvements to their policies, to their processes, but also the way that they interact with their staff and are genuinely interested in listening to the views of their staff and using that to develop their strategy. And then at a wider level across the NHS, um, I think this has gone from being a, an initiative to being quite normalised now, that if you go into a trust, it's not um, something that, is, is peculiar, that people know who their guardian is. Um, as I go and give uh, talks, I will ask the audience, do you know who your Freedom to Speak Up guardian? Have you heard of this before? And I've seen a, a, probably an improvement in that from about 20% of hands going up to now you know, over 50% and sometimes even more than that. We're also looking at it from the reverse side of it as well, which is that um, organisations that haven't um, had any cases raised or who haven't sent us data for quite a long period of time have thought very much about what's not working well um, and have adapted their system so that they get the right person in the role or people in the role as guardian, and then they start seeing cases coming through. So I think it's early days. When I talk to people in the airline industry, they say they've been doing this for over 40 years, so two years down the line, they wouldn't be expecting to see much. But it feels different to me when I go to visit trusts, talk to staff, and actually see the benefits that they're getting from having the guardians. Thanks. Moira, did you? I'm just going to say, I think that um, Henrietta and her team and the Guardians themselves face the challenge that the NHS faces generally of how do you get good positive developments replicated across the piece. It's, um, uh, it's not special to, um, uh, to Guardians, but I've been, uh, on behalf of NHS England, a member of the Accountability and Liaison Board, which is the sort of uh, governance that's been um, established for... Um, uh, Henrietta and her uh, colleagues, uh, and I think the progress that's been made uh, means that this is um, the right time to review that governance, particularly given that NHSI and E are coming much closer together, and uh, a board of two rather than uh, three would feel distinctly odd, and I think there is a, a question about whether um, it sh con should continue to be non-execs or could become uh, a more appropriately an executive function, but I think that this is the time to, to do that, not just that I'm good. <laughs> yeah, so, first of all, I think both Henry and Grant are made great progress in the last year since you were here last time, so thank you for that. I guess my, my question is that freedom to speak up needs to be matched by willingness to listen and act. Um, other, and therefore both on an individual basis but also on a systemic and learning basis. So I'd be intrigued to hear from both of you, both within NHS England but also more uh, across the health sector, whether you think there is a willingness to listen and act that's coming in or whether there are still barriers to people sort of accepting that things have gone wrong and need to be addressed. I'm happy to start off. Okay. I would absolutely agree with you that the freedom to speak up is when le leaders and managers listen. Yeah. That is the freedom. And obviously exactly. it's a slightly unusual title to have and I've done quite a lot of okay. thinking about what it means. Um, so I think that's variable and it can be variable between organisations, within organisations, even within teams. I take the view that we want to have growth mindset. So there's something about you can't fix everything that you call out, but until you call it out, you can't fix Correct. it. So part of it is developing environments of psychological safety yeah. where not only people feel able to speak up, but managers have got the time and the capacity um, and, and the confidence to be able to hear those things. Yeah. Um, so I would say that goes all the way up through the NHS into the commissioners, the regulators, the inspectors. Um, and Part of that is having boards who've got the mindset that they really want to know what's happening, 
um, but then translating that into training and uh, time and leadership into the middle managers as well. So we've got to support middle managers to have the time and to have the skills and to, to feel that there is uh, room within what they're expecting to manage to be able to hear the, the ideas and the concerns from their teams. And if we can translate that all the way back down to the workforce, then that gives them that freedom. And I think this issue of the psychological safety, both to, both to acknowledge that things haven't worked and to see it as an opportunity to improve without getting sort of dumped on from on high, yes. which is what often can happen, because that's what the disconnect between, if you like, the, the behaviour as to how people are responded when they're trying to do something to improve, recognising that things under their watch have gone wrong or not as well as they could have done. I think is a real responsibility for boards to set that tone. In my industry, financial services, you know, that's been a big conversation over the last sort of five to ten years. Still, I think room to improve, uh, and I, I'd encourage you to, <coughs> to think really sort of hard and quite forcefully about making sure that boards recognise that they have to lead by how they react when things go wrong, not just about sort of recognising about how we encourage the freedom to actually raise issues. Yeah, and we do have a pan sector network because we recognise that even if we look at the very best in the NHS, there will still be more that we can learn from other sectors. So in the pan sector network, we have representatives from the army, from ACAS, from banks, finance, from aviation, but also from sport, you know, from, from uh, regulators, uh, and everybody's struggling with the same thing. So there's no, nobody's got this perfect, um, but there's so much that we can learn from the way that other sectors approach this, and also in terms of the, the support and the training that they give to their workforce, which I think is absolutely key. Emily, then. Sorry, Emily, then Victor. Yeah, yeah. I, I was obviously agree with everything Henry has said on that. As, as Henry and I have discussed, I think to some extent the, the need to have a freedom to speak up guardian indicates that we don't have the listening culture in the first place, right? Because if everybody was open to learning, we wouldn't need a separate way for people to go. If, if I look at the eight cases that have been raised inside NHS England, the freedom to speak up guardians this year, um, at, at more, than, more than one of them, but I won't commit to exactly how many, didn't need wouldn't have needed to have been a freedom to speak up issue had earlier conversations been had in the right kind of listening way so there's obviously more we can do what we have done is some of what um, Henrietta's talking about is we have the line manager development program which about a quarter of the organization are eligible for and some of whom have already done and then now we have the senior line manager development program which has only had one and a half cohorts so far of 30 people each we've built in this whole area of how to have these kind of conversations, how to listen without f feeling like you're taking all of the blame. I'm not going to say that is a, a magic bullet, but it's sort of one line that at least starts people's awareness of how they need to respond when these kind of things come up. I take your point that it's probably something we can look at again as an executive group, and it is something we are discussing with NHS improvement because obviously given the work they already do, they have, um, we need to be consistent, but equally there are sort of abilities and approaches they've got that we could learn from and build into how we approach this as well. I mean, it's, this is good stuff. I mean, how can you say anything else? It is good stuff. The question uh, is this notion of how you, is this about developing a learning culture, isn't it? Basically, yeah. it's about learning. And so I am curious about how we are, whether we have a whole system approach to this with our, you know, the Leadership Academy, Workforce Race Equality Strategy, you know, just, just how, could you say a bit more about how we're approaching the whole system? You've mentioned some training stuff, but I just think that's the, um, including people, you know, around this table, the, you know, fish rots from the head and all that stuff. Um, and the other is, I just wonder what in a year's time, because I know it's early days and these things, you know, take time, but what what signals are you looking for that, that, that we're actually moving in the right direction? You know, that what kind of culture, what shifts are you looking for in the first year? Because, of course, this is a, an, in, an it's initiative because we're failing to do something. So the, I'm just interested in what, what shift are we looking to, to see in the first year that might indicate that we're doing the right, it's the right intervention, you know? Um. What systemic shift? I'd like to see changes quicker than a year. I think every trust should have ring fence time for their freedom to speak up guardian. I think the idea that they're able to do this valuable and Im important work on fresh air and goodwill is uh, doesn't do justice to their staff. It doesn't suggest the right level of investment into the workforce. Um, 
And we've seen the knock-on effect of people not having ring fence time is that they don't present to their board in person. The boards need to be meeting the guardians to ask them the right questions. They don't turn up to training or to regional meetings where they get the support and the learning from their colleagues. And probably most importantly, they don't seek feedback on their performance. And it's only that very first question I was asked, how do we know that this is working? We only know if it's working if people are actually asked for their experience. Well, how was it for you? Would you do this again? So I think that's the thing I would be looking for very quickly. And then when boards are actually meeting their guardians and being able to ask them the right questions, they'll then understand what's happening in their own organisation. So for me, that would be sine qua non first step. And the workforce risk equality strategy, how's that? Oh, well, in, in trusts, we expect guardians to work in partnership with the res team, with complaints and incidents, with staff side, occupational health, with the guardian of safe working, so that they can start learning about the hotspots of culture in their own trusts. So we see that as absolutely key, and we do model that similarly um, at national level. Richard, then we're going to move on. Richard. Yeah, one, very, one very quick one, because it will be near that maybe being very naive on this chair, but it's the, it's the issue that Henrietta raised about settlement letters. And I thought we'd moved beyond settlement letters in any way, preventing people from speaking up on patient safety issues. So I was surprised that was still there as an issue. Have I, have I misunderstood what you've said, or am I, have I been incredibly naive? Um, so my experience is that the way that they're written can be so opaque is that it doesn't make it clear. Um, and also, if the existence of the settlement agreement in itself is confidential, then that can inhibit um, people from approaching, for example, the whistleblower support scheme, from joining my, account, my um, advisory working group. But there's something about the way the wording is written, that if it says that under section 43J of the ERA, your rights are fully established, not everybody understands what that means. And on another part of the document, there may be a whole paragraph saying you can't say anything about the circumstances leading up to the termination of your employment. So it's confusing, and we're working to clarify that so that anyone who signs a settlement agreement, it is absolutely crystal clear what their rights are. So do you, uh, do you rather than lots of lawyers, don't you just need to say every settlement letter needs to have a sentence in that says none of this prevents you <coughs> speaking up on patient Precisely. safety issues? It sort of feels quite simple. Precisely. Okay. Well, it is as simple as that. Can't we do that? Well, that's what we're doing through NHS employers. We're providing additional information to okay. go along with their new guidance. Okay. I mean, just, just on a mechanism that might help Henry Ezra on that, and we can take this offline, but I mean, it's possible mm. we could introduce through the standard contract a requirement which would say that those uh, clear uh, guarantees have to be included in any such process, and we have begun to use the NHS standard contract for a variety of. Uh, what have traditionally been off-limits HR-type topics, including obviously repayment of redundancies and other matters. So yeah. let's work with you on that and see if we can get that sorted. Sounds wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Th Henry, thanks very much. You mentioned, so in I think West Suffolk, you said, have, have changed from freedom to speak up to freedom to improve, I think. You mentioned they did that even before the Francis report. Okay, which is a really nice way of doing it, going back to the learning culture that Victor was talking about. I mean, maybe, is it Steve Dunn as the chief executive there? I mean, maybe we might ask him to come down and sort of tell us you know, what he's done. Mm. Or may not, not necessarily him, but you may, there may be someone else, but he would be probably quite good to do that. I think it's one example mm. of many great examples that I've seen across the country where okay. this is really you know, affecting the staff. So. Okay. Well, it'll be good to hear from them as well at some point. Thanks Thank very you. much. Thank you. Um, and thanks, Emily. Thanks very much. Um, Steve. Uh, thank See, you, uh, David. Uh, Before I start, and of course, yeah. with your permission, I'd like to invite Professor Carrie McEwen um, to join me at the yeah. table. Uh, Carrie is chair of the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges, uh, and the Academy is one of our key partners in developing mm. this uh, policy. Hello, Carrie. So, welcome. welcome. Thank you. Um, so the board will remember that in July I presented a consultation paper that set out uh, that set out proposals to tackle. Uh, the inequitable provision of inappropriate interventions across the country. And I'm sure the board will agree that where there is evidence of clinical and cost effectiveness, we should endeavour to introduce new treatment to the clinical practice as quickly as possible. But it's just as important that we discontinue treatments and interventions where evidence suggests that uh, these treatments are inappropriate or ineffective. 
And there are a number of reasons for doing this, of which I highlight three again. So first and foremost, we should not offer treatments that at best disappoint or inconvenience uh, our patients uh, and at the very worst potentially harm them. Secondly, we should ensure that we deploy our most precious resource, that's our staff, to activities that are of proven clinical benefit. And third, of course, we have a responsibility to use taxpayers' money wisely. So with the Board's approval, we consulted on the evidence-based intervention programme from the 4th of July to the 28th of September this year. And during that consultation period, we spoke to nearly 400 people at various events and workshops, and we received over 700 online responses and almost 100 email responses to our consultation questionnaire. So we're very grateful to all those who've contributed uh, because we have absolutely benefited from a rich array of suggestions and insights from patients, members of the public, clinicians, specialist societies, and national representative bodies and commissioners. In response to that feedback, we've now made a number of changes to our proposals, and I'd like to highlight the following three to the board today. First, we've refocused the programme's five goals to ensure we focus on the appropriate use of interventions. We've also strengthened our collaborative approach by establishing a new national steering group uh, that includes uh, patient and clinical representation. This group has helped shape our response and will guide our implementation. We've also refined the messaging to ensure that what we're aiming to do is to ensure that interventions in the NHS, the, that the NHS offers are appropriate uh, and effective. Second, we have revised our clinical criteria for the 17 interventions following extensive consultation with clinical specialists and CCGs to ensure that they are based on the clinical evidence developed by NICE, NICE accredited or specialist society guidance. As examples, these include expanding the recommendation wording for carpal tunnel syndrome, Jupiter's contracture release, ganglion excision and trigger finger release to align with proposals we receive from the British Society of the Hand. Secondly, to exclude children from the criteria related to Jupiter's contracture release, trigger uh, finger release and snoring surgery, as these conditions present differently in children and may indicate more serious underlying conditions. Thirdly, we've clarified that children who cannot undergo normal assessments are still able to access specialist advice for glue ear. And finally, accounting for a wide range of views on coding methodology, uh, testing this with coding experts, clinicians and demonstrator sites, we are updating the active, uh, activity projections uh, accordingly. So we've also worked with commissioners and providers to test our proposals and we are setting up a number of uh, a demonstrator community uh, to continue to refine our proposals and monitor uh, implementation. Our work with these sites is including testing our activity reduction figures, which we refined in light of changes to the clinical criteria and changes to our ambition, uh, refining our approach to accessing the procedures. Uh, so there are four interventions which will require a successful individual funding request, and this will be backed up by changes to the national tariff and NHS standard contract. Uh, and for the remaining 13 interventions, we will leave it to CCG discretion to determine how to achieve the goals. However, we would encourage a prior approval pr process uh, where there are concerns. And finally, clarifying that through the financial and contractual changes, uh, that these will start, although these will start from April 2019, our expectation is that commissioners, providers and clinicians will start to implement the clinical criteria from today. Uh, the rationale for this is that we want to ensure patients have access to the most appropriate interventions as possible and to minimise avoidable harm to patients uh, as rapidly as possible. Uh, lastly, I'd like to make two additional points. Uh, I think it's really important to reiterate that we are not proposing a ban on any of these procedures. Instead, we're recommending that specific clinical criteria are met before they are undertaken. All 17 interventions will still be available in certain situations according to criteria that we've outlined in our guidance. I must emphasise again, we've based these criteria on NICE guidance and worked with clinical experts to get them right for our patients. And secondly, because we think national consistency is important, we are proposing to issue our clinical criteria as statutory guidance. Um, I'm therefore going to ask the board to approve the policy document and furthermore to approve the publication of the clinical criteria as statutory uh, guidance. I'd like to thank on behalf of uh, myself and uh, Ian Dodge, who's uh, the other uh, senior sponsor of this programme, to personally thank everybody who's contributed to the programme, public, uh, 
patients, uh, commissioners, uh, specialist societies. Uh, and finally, like to note our intention uh, to continue this work and to return to the board uh, at a future board meeting with further proposals. Before I hand back to you for discussion, I'd like to ask Ian uh, if he has any further comments, and then Carrie uh, uh, for comments uh, from our one of our key partners, the Academy. Yeah. Well, Carrie, do you want to? Well, Carrie, thank first? you very much for all the work that you and your fellow presidents of the colleges have put into this. It's incredibly helpful for us. So, have you got any comments you'd like to make? Uh, the only uh, comment I would like to add to that is that we, well, one, we have been very pleased to be involved in that it reflects a lot of the background that we've been working towards to reduce waste and harm to patients due to over-medicalisation, which we all recognise is, is out there and happening. Up to 20% of, of investigations and interventions may not be benefiting patients. So we're looking at that very seriously, and this fits very well, particularly along with the, the Choosing Wisely campaign that, that we're we're involved in. The other thing that is, is, is variation, that we have identified that there is considerable variation in, in many things, but particularly these groups here. And again, that fits in very well with how the evidence base, how we'd like to see things working. And in the past, what's happened with medicine generally is that interventions and, and, uh, and investigations go in and out depending on the maturity of the clinicians largely and, and their skills, whereas now what we're trying to do I think is manage that better, which is inevitably going to be better for patients. So I think that th that along with our drive for shared decision making, it's been very clear <coughs> that there has been no suggestion anything's going to be banned, but what this is hoping to do is to encourage patients and families to ask more questions as to why they may be getting an investigation or a treatment and something else might be better for them and they are better involved in that process. Do you see a lot of variation in your, in your role where you are, a lot of variation in, in medical practice around the country? Yeah. Yes, there is. Um, and that's one of the reasons, in fact, that the college is bought in so readily to the Getting It Right First Time project, which is looking at that. Um, and so that they, as, as specialists, can go into different units and identify why that might be and try and help to, 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 to reduce that. And again, with this, um, with the, um, the project in mind here, there was suggestion that, that some CCGs were, were being more draconian than others, in that they were already harder than the than, than we were being suggested on the evidence base and really want to raise them so that they're not they're using the evidence base appropriately so it's not just a clamp down it's that it's, a, it's an improvement to try and again reduce that variation which we're very concerned about and have you found that clinicians have been supportive of this program on, on balance i mean obviously some people would have had reservations about it but on, on the whole do you find that the the profession has been really driving this philosophically yes I think it's always very difficult to change practice um, of an individual and also of a unit, and I think that that's a challenge that people do recognise. We, we've had a lot of engagement with, with our professional colleagues, particularly through the college and through our the various specialist societies, and I think, as I said, they have been very beneficial discussions and uh, have certainly allowed us to come to a common understanding of the evidence base. Uh, and that, that those discussions are reflected in our final guidance. Anyone got any questions? No one. Um, <coughs> I'm very supportive, Steve, of the uh, policy framework, and I think it's suitably nuanced as well, particularly with CAT2 and access to IFR in exception cases. But I'm intrigued to know, um, in the consultation process, how you took account of some of the patient views, because comes out quite strongly that <clears throat> clinicians are very supportive, but patients less so. Did the patient voice get reflected adequately in the structure of the policy framework, in your view? Yes, I think it did. Um, and, and what we were clear in terms of the consult, we were looking for a number of things in the consultation, asked a number of questions, but really it comes back to the evidence base and, and consistently what we were looking for. Uh, predominantly was to test whether the evidence base or our interpretation of the evidence base uh, was correct. Now, I think by necessity, um, the comments on the evidence base came disproportionately from specialist societies, colleges, experts in the field, I think 
there's an inevitability about that. Uh, but I think in terms of weighting input into our reconsideration of the um, evidence base, we treated all inputs equally. I don't know, Ian, whether you want to add to that? Yes, yeah, so if I could add, I think there was a, 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 a distinction between the responses of the national patient representative organisations as well as some of the individual patient responders. Um, and so the national organisations were um, more supportive than some of the individual responses we had back. Secondly, I think we found during the um, engagement processes, consultation events, actually that having the dialogue with people in the room really helped dispel lots of the myths and concerns that existed. And thirdly, we know that um, a number of the individual patient responses um, were partly because of a concern either that there was a blanket ban um, or that we were actually um, intending to you know, radically stop the number of procedures in a way that wasn't evidenced by the clinical criteria um, that we've actually established or that this was about um, cuts uh, to NHS funding. Um, and actually, instead, what we're really trying to do here is to free up scarce professional time, create headroom for innovation, as well as perform other interventions. And I think what it partly emphasises is the need for us to continue to plug away with really effective communications, including with those patient groups. Excellent. Well, it's a great bit of work, Steve. I think we're all wholly in favour of it, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah, Carrie, many thanks to you and all your okay. members for contributing to it as well. Thanks very much. Thanks, Carrie. Steve, the next one is you as well. Yes, so this can, this is um, part of a similar um, area of work, and uh, with your permission again, I'd like to invite Bruce Warner, who's Deputy Chief Pharmacist, to join me um, here at the uh, board table. Um, so um, during 2017-18, CCG guidance was published uh, by NHS England and NHS Clinical Commissioners for... Firstly, items which should not be routinely prescribed in primary care, that was in November uh, 2017, a year ago, including recommendations on 18 items. Uh, and then in March 2018, uh, for conditions for which over-the-counter items should not be routinely prescribed in primary care. So that included recommendations on 35 uh, minor conditions and vitamins, minerals and probiotics. So the clinical working group uh, that has been um, underpinning and developing that work uh, committed to reviewing that guidance at least annually, uh, ident identifying potential items to be retained, removed or added uh, to that guidance. Uh, and uh, the first thing I would like to bring to the board's attention today is that using established processes within that working group, uh, a review of the existing item recommendations from the no November 2017 guidance has, has been undertaken. And of those recommendations, uh, uh, we propose that guidance for one of the 18 items, that's rubefacients, including topical non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, will be updated uh, to consider the exclusion of cas uh, caps capsaicin cream in line with NICE guidance. And <laughs> It's in your paper, Simon. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, and, and that recommendation will be part of the consultation, which is the second part of um, what I'm going to bring to the attention of the board. Uh, so secondly, the clinical working group proposed that the following eight new items will be included in the draft CCG guidance uh, for consultation. So these are firstly items of relatively low clinical effectiveness uh, or which are unsafe. And so that list is amiodarone, which is a medication used to treat abnormal heart rhythms, uh, uh, dronedarone to treat uh, chronic atrial fibrillation, bath and shower preparations for dry and pruritic skin conditions, menocycline for acne, and silk garments for eczema and dermatitis. And then three items which are clinically effective, but where more cost-effective items are available. So that's alaskirin for, to treat blood pressure, blood pressure testing strips for type 2 diabetes and needles for pre-filled and reusable insulin pens. And I think it's important with respect to those latter two items for diabetes, what we are proposing in the consultation is not that GPs do not, don't prescribe them, but they prescribe uh, cost-effective products, i.e. Uh, products that we know can be obtained at a lower price uh, than uh, the full range of um, items that we see at the moment. So this is not about removing them, it's about cost-effective prescribing. Uh, so it should be noted that this is not a complete ban, it's about selecting more clinically or cost-effective alternative medicines and items where appropriate. 
So the board in this part are asked to approve a three-month formal public consultation on the draft CCG guidance and subject to this the draft guidance and equality in health inequalities impact assessment will be published and the consultation will run from today the 28th of November to the 28th of February 2019. And third and finally I will just want to say a few things on gluten-free food CCG guidance. So the Department of Health and Social Care has undertaken two national consultations on the prescribing of gluten-free products in primary care in March 2017 and August 2018. As a result of those consultations, regulations were laid in Parliament on the 6th of November uh, and subject to annulment by either House of Parliament, they will come into force on the 4th of December 2018. Uh, part 15, Borderline Substances, and Part 18A, Schedule 1 of the Drug Tariff will be updated for the December edition to reflect these changes. So in line with that, NHS England has developed guidance documents for a guidance document for CCGs setting out the national recommendations on the prescribing of gluten-free foods in primary care. And this is intended to communicate the changes to the blacklisting of some GF foods and to support CCGs with the development of their local uh, prescribing policies with respect to gluten-free food. The guidance advises CCGs firstly to support prescribers to prescribe in line with the revised regulations uh, which allow for no gluten-free products to be prescribed at NHS expense other than gluten-free bread and or gluten-free mixes. And secondly, that patients in receipt of NHS prescriptions for gluten-free bread and or mixes should be those diagnosed by their doctors as suffering from established gluten-sensitive enteropathies, including dermatitis, hepatoformis and celiac disease. The guidance has been clinically reviewed by the Low Priority Prescribing Clinical Working Group and I'm asking the board today to approve the publication of that CCG guidance and the Equality in Health Inequalities Impact Assessment. Anything that you would like to add, Bruce? No, I think that, uh, that covers it. I think, Steve, thank you. Thanks very much. Any, any questions for Steve? I mean, I think the case is so strong that it sort of it doesn't really need a lot of questioning. Is it, has any, anyone got any any, anything that anyone wants to raise? No? Well, look, I think it's another, it's another great bit of work. Um, uh, thank you. And Bruce, I'm sure you've contributed a lot to this as well. And sorry no, that you've been here and haven't had, been able to say very much, no, no, but no, I think it's all, it's all been said, really. We'll, so. we'll, following the consultation, we'll come back with a, a further paper asking yeah. for approval, so I'm sure we can have further yeah. discussion at that point. Great. Yes, both these programmes have worked with huge amounts of work, and so I would like to publicly thank yeah. the pharmacy yeah. team yeah. under the leadership of Keith Ridge, chief pharmacist in the development of the... Uh, guidance on prescribing, uh, but also uh, Ian's team and my own team, particularly Johannes and Aoife, who are in the audience today, who've done a huge amount of work uh, around the consultation uh, on the evidence-based interventions. Very good. Well, thank you very much, Bruce. Many thanks for coming. Right, next item is item seven. Matthew. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd uh, like to update the board on progress uh, with the negotiation of a new voluntary medicines pricing scheme. Um, uh, medicines pricing is governed by uh, there's something called the Pharmaceutical Price uh, Regulation Scheme, scheme, which is a voluntary agreement between government and the industry. The current uh, voluntary scheme is due to expire on the 31st of December, um, and the uh, heads of agreement for a new voluntary scheme have now been agreed between the government, uh, NHS England, and the eight BPI. Uh, negotiations do continue on the final details of the agreement, but good progress has been made. Uh, and the new scheme is intended to run for five years through to the end of December 2024. Uh, the voluntary scheme, of course, operates alongside a statutory scheme, uh, which has recently been uh, refreshed um, and has made its way through the appropriate parliamentary procedures. Uh, in, in approaching these negotiations, uh, as NHS England, we have been keen to strike a balance both, uh, both between ensuring that future spend on branded medicines is sustainable and affordable uh, within uh, our future settlement, um, and, but also that it is more predictable both for um, ourselves and for the industry. Um, but also equally importantly, we're very keen to ensure uh, that the approach we take to medicines pricing and the detail of the voluntary scheme supports uh, faster um, uh, uptake uh, and development of truly innovative treatments and gets those transformative products to patients um, as quickly as possible. Uh, the terms of the new scheme um, 
are such that the allowable growth rate in uh, branded medicines uh, over the period will be 2% nominal in each year of the scheme, uh, such that any spend beyond those levels uh, is repaid back to uh, the NHS in the form of a rebate. Uh, that rebate will clearly, um, as agreed uh, with the uh, government when we did the long-term settlement uh, negotiations in June, the proceeds of that rebate will say will flow back to the NHS to support the long-term plan and the uh, priorities for transformation and better patient care that will be uh, embodied in that plan. Um, the, uh, as I say, final um, uh, the final uh, details of the deal will be uh, signed in the coming weeks, such that the new scheme can begin from the 1st of January. Well, this is a great deal for the NHS, and, and I think it's a good deal for industry as well. It gives certainty uh, before. I don't know whether Simon or, or you, but I should just sort of comment on the differences between the new PPRS scheme and the old one, which didn't actually, in the end, quite deliver what we wanted it to do. I think there's a, a sense uh, that this is a, a significant improvement on what has gone before, both from the NHS point of view and from uh, potentially from industry point of view. We had a meeting of the new Life Sciences Council last week, chaired by the uh, Secretary of State for Business and uh, the Secretary of State for Health and the Chief Executive of AstraZeneca with good industry uh, representation there. And I think there was a shared sense that uh, at a time of some uncertainty around Brexit, actually having this clarity as to what the next five years look like in terms of medicines is helpful to industry as well as to the NHS. And there are some sort of win-win uh, features around the promotion of uptake, which the headroom uh, that the deal creates will allow us to bring about. And as Matt said, uh, crucially from the NHS England point of view, the fact that the uh, uh, net uh, savings accrue back to the NHS on top of the 3.4% funding settlement that we secured in June means that we can use that funding to sustain further innovation. Yes, yeah, so I think congratulations to all those on the here and at the DH who were involved in that. It's a, it's a really good outcome. Yeah. Good, thanks very much, um, Matthew. Um, Adelimu Bab. Matthew. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, so this is a this is a good news story uh, for the NHS, and um, start by uh, thanking the the team in our specialised commissioning team and and some of Matt's finance people who've steered this through over over the last few months. This is Adalimumab, which is. Um, the single highest spend drug in the NHS, which we currently spend 400 million uh, pounds a year on, has uh, come out of patent or comes out of patent from the 1st of December. And the team have uh, worked across the industry to um, uh, run a, um, a, a complex, a sophisticated, but, but, but quite rapid procurement process uh, with the aim of doing two things. One was to create plural plurality in the market, as in more than one company supply, supplying uh, this medication or, a, or the biosimilar equivalent of it, uh, and the other to drive value for money uh, for the NHS. The upshot of that is that we now have um, both the uh, original uh, provider of the branded product and four new uh, suppliers of biosimilar equivalents um, are now supplying, will now be supplying to the NHS, saving the NHS £300 million um, through, through this negotiation. So new contract value of £100 million a year. We had estimated that um, we could save uh, £150 million through, per year through this deal. So this is done twice uh, as well as that through both the um, uh, original creator of, of the drugs re uh, uh, reducing their price as, as their patent comes to an end and the pricing of uh, <laughs> of, of the the new vendors um, so I think this is a, this, this is uh, this is tremendous use for the NHS this money is already being uh, planned to be recycled into uh, being sp uh, spent on other things uh, creating uh, more and better care, care for patients and we had forecasts when we looked at uh, biological medicines and biosimilars um, 
a while ago in our paper, we forecast that there were a potential 200 to 300 million pounds worth of savings by uh, uh, the year 2021. So we have obviously exceeded that with the first deal that we've done here. And there are a pipeline of other opportunities, not as large as this one, but of other opportunities that are of uh, leveraging this, this technology to improve care and, and, and value for patients. Yeah, uh, 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 yeah, other uh, other drugs coming off uh, off patent in a, in a variety of high cost areas where we would expect to be able to negotiate <coughs> um, new pricing arrangements for the, for the NHS as they come through through our specialised commission arrangements. I think this drug is the highest selling drug ever, I mean, eighteen billion dollars a year or something across around the world. I mean, it's been a phenomenal drug. Yeah. Well, it's a good news story. It's a really good news story, mm. and it's a, uh, a good sign that, uh, in working in partnership with the industry, we can make the NHS an attractive area for uh, biosimilar companies to want to come and provide product into, yeah. whilst working with our existing partners to make sure that, that, that it still works for them as well. Two very small points to add to that, uh, David. The first is that, as we said when this was announced, this is a demonstration of the superior regulatory approach that the UK and Europe take to biosimilars than does the United States, uh, which enables us to have these savings faster. And secondly, there is nothing automatic about the fact that notwithstanding the patent expiry, we would have got this level of savings. Actually, it's a tribute to the way in which the uh, procurement uh, was undertaken and the various uh, competitor pharma companies, including the originator, uh, responded to that. And I would be very surprised if we haven't got some of the best prices uh, in Europe on the back of it, notwithstanding the fact that the patent has expired everywhere. I think that's beyond question, I think. It will be really, in, I don't know whether it, how confidential it is, it may be all confidential, but as a case study of how to price uh, a biosimilar, really it will be really interesting. <laughs> 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 yes, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's terrific anyway. So, any, any, any comments on that? No. I mean, it's just worth, just for the, for the record, I mean, this drug came out of Cambridge, you know, out of the, the LMB in Cambridge, you know, 20 years ago or something, and all that value that could have been captured for the UK economy, and so much of it has gone to the US, and most of the manufacturing of these biologics is done in the, in, in the US, and it could have been done here. Hmm? That's the thing we need to learn from. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we do. Yeah, right here. And Chair, I think as well as celebrating the human, we can we can support and encourage the efforts of pharmacists and clinicians uh, who are already doing fantastic work to prepare for the switching that uh, now must take place between uh, the originator and the uh, and the new and the new um, products as well. That's crucial to realising the savings. Yeah. And, and just one last one. I think I, I remember these jobs first coming into. In, in the NHS and the tremendous impact that they had for patients. Mm. So I think we should also bear in mind that this is a sign that we can bring the best drugs in, in the world it, to, uh, to patients in the NHS. The impact on patients uh, w with uh, rheumatoid arthritis and other conditions was, uh, was spectacular at the time that it first came in. It was a transformational drug that when, when, when it first came through and the ability to bring those through is dependent on our ability to negotiate deals like this and therefore move on to, 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 to the next generation of medications that we want to bring through to patients. Yeah. I think there is an opportunity for us to enter into some uh, richer collaborations with industry uh, that are about getting a better deal for patients as well as things that are good for the UK economy. Yeah. And this is, I think, one of the things that we'll want to look at inevitably as part of the long-term plan and what we do on supporting yeah. innovation in this country. Yeah. I mean, how we can work with the pharma company to drive down the cost of developing these drugs and make them affordable at the end of the day. Yeah. Okay, no, well, Matthew, thank you very much for that. Um, Jane, empowering people and communities. Thank you, Chair. Mike, Mike Neil Churchill, who is our um, responsible director for experience participation and equalities. So this is the third report um, of the Empowering People and Communities Task Force. Um, as you know, or many, the board will know, uh, we set this up for a year. So the final meeting is due uh, next month in, in December 
And this particular paper sets out um, an update, really, on what we've done on the priority areas around personalised care and frailty, and attached to the paper are letters that have been written by the two co-chairs um, to the SROs for those. We also have updated on the work we've done to support engagement with a long-term plan, and I think that's been really, really important, and actually we've done uh, more this time than we've ever done before. It also has helped us to determine the future uh, for the NHS Assembly. Um, and it also sets out principles on how we want to engage more with the voluntary sector, um, community and social enterprise sector going forward, which I think is really important. Um, as the board will know, we've previously reported on the work we've done with the other priority areas like cancer and mental health. And again, it gives an update on some of the changes that have, that have happened since then. Um, in December, so there'll be one final report um, in early 2019, and the plan is that we also include some an update on digital transformation um, at that one. And before I hand over to Victor as one of the co-chairs, I just wanted to make the point that I think the task force has been really instrumental in helping us think through how we engage in a better way. It has really prioritised... Um, uh, or looked at the priorities, it's looked at how we can improve some of the health inequalities that we see across the system. And it's looked at a very different way of engaging. So both using social media, having things like Twitter chats, but also actually having a sort of deep, um, deep dive workshops with rel relevant people, members of the public, um, around what it means to them. And I think that's brought a very different approach to the way we've, we've done this before. Um, and I'd just like to say um, a thank you both to Neil and his team, but also to Victor and Michelle for the work they've led. Their passion and commitment to actually making sure this is works has been um, phenomenal and has made a real difference to how we've been able to engage. And I think uh, the work of the task force and the, and the way we've been able to report this over the last few months has really shown a difference. So um, I will commend the report to you. I'll hand over to Victor as one of the co-chairs to see if he wants to add anything. And Neil's obviously here um, as the lead director who um, will also be able to help with any questions that, that people may ask. Thank you very much. Um, Neil, should we come to, we just go to Victor first and come to you, is that all right? So, um, the first thing I'd like to do is thank all the people that have been involved with us in this. It's, uh, the approach has been different. It's different to the way we, um, NHS um, England or NHS has done things in that we designed a process that was inclusive of both patients and the public and then we ran the process um, live as it were and we've had, you know, in, e in each area that we've looked at we've had hundreds and indeed in some cases thousands of people sending in uh, using social media and, and adding their value, their voice to this, and that's produced some insights into the experience of the interventions that we're trying to, uh, the inter in experience and outcomes of some of the interventions that we're trying to run. So, for example, the work we did on cancer, um, I thought, brought out some really um, new, I think, insights into the impact of the cancer program on BME groups and on um, those groups that are. Uh, and young people and brought out the issues of inequality and the same goes for mental health where some work was done on how we co-produce uh, mental health programs and then recently work done on frailty um, where the issues of definition and experience but also the notion that frailty isn't just something that affects elderly people it is a young person's issue as well actually you know kind of changes the way in which we look at program design and allocation of resource what i'd like to do is draw attention to the work uh, that i'd like hopefully like the board to approve um, which is the work on the vse uh, VCSE principles. Now, the reason why this work was being done is that there's a view and an experience that the current arrangements are either uh, are neither clear nor necessarily um, helpful on both sides, actually, to understanding um, how we build a strong partnership with the VCSE sector. Um, and therefore, uh, what we have done is, is work with that sector and with NHS um, England on how a, a set of principles might be brought together to enable better engagement, clear engagement, more transparent engagement, and bring in the seldom heard voices uh, that I think will add value to programmes going forward, and in particular in relation to the long-term plan. So I'd like to invite the board to approve that those principles, and then the next step will be to roll them out and ensure that they are practised. In conclusion, um, the task force, I think, has hopefully, you know, I wouldn't claim <laughs> 
hopefully shown that actually engaging the public is a safe an appropriate thing to do and helpful and actually you know some of the fears around doing that have turned out to be chimeras they're not real and the public can add value to what we do if we design it properly um, and that insight may well be helpful to the design of the NHS assembly which I hope um, uh, that is the case and also sets a high standard for this work going forward um, I think that the NHS is something which was created by the public and therefore should engage and involve the public if you wish it to both save money and increase its efficacy. So this is a small step in that direction that hopefully will act as a catalyst, in particular the areas of inequality, which you know are close to my heart. We've driven through this process and I think shown the, um, the, an insightful view and partnership with people who are at the sharp end of the inverse care law can help us both save money and increase programme effectiveness. We have the last meeting, um, which will look at the digital in this, using exactly the same methodology as we've done for all other programmes. Um, going forward, the last uh, meeting, the last report, which I won't be here for, um, will uh, be looking at the improvement action to support um, engagement, because I think it is a, a, an ongoing story how we do that. Um, developing closer partnerships with the voluntary sector, assuming that, that pro the principles are approved here and supporting better empowerment of people um, within the NHS priority programmes that will come out of the, the forward view. So hopefully um, uh, uh, then the board and colleagues have found this work useful over the year and I hope it, the, the learning will continue into other programmes. Mm -hmm. I think just to pay tribute to Victor and his leadership um, on this uh, agenda, I think um, I had an email from one of the voluntary sector leaders who's a member of the task force um, who commented how positive um, he'd found it to, to witness these conversations between leaders in the system um, and um, citizens who are marginalised or ignored in a lot of conversations and to see that those conversations result in listening and action. Um, and he said, uh, can we have more like this, please? Um, uh, so I think it, it was designed to strengthen us in, in the areas of uh, patient and public engagement and patient experience. I think Rick, Rick has really led that from the front um, with a real moral authority. Um, and we've definitely heard uh, things that we wouldn't have heard otherwise. So just say thank you, Victor. And I think we, we do want to build on this and uh, take it on. No. Um, just to focus on the VCSE dimension of the paper, um, which has come an awfully long way since we st first started talking about co-production two years ago. Um, you mentioned, Victor, in the paper the idea that link workers should be an inte integral part of our delivery model in areas like integrated care and prevention and well-being. <coughs> Could you just sort of articulate the, your conclusion about that in terms of the long-term plan? Do you think link workers should be an integral piece of the way that we design the next wave of care model in the community? Well, the short answer is yes. <laughs> I think we should be, um, you know, the lesson, the lesson of, the, of the, well, there's two things. First of all, the lesson of the work on the task force is that we can engage the public and receive insights that are powerful and helpful to, and, and leaders of the system can talk to the public in a way that actually engage. Secondly, the VCSC sector, um, is, should be adding value in a more organised way. And the, the notion of link workers is, is a suggestion as to how that might work. I'll invite Neil to say more about the detail, but I think um, we need a more structured approach in our relationship with the VCSE sector if it's going to add value. And I can't think of an area in the 10-year forward view where that isn't the case. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think that's, 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 the, that's where we got to. I don't know whether you want to say more about Well, I, I'm just going to... Sorry. I was going to say that certainly that was very much part of the conversation we had with James Anderson and his comprehensive model in relation to personalised care and, and to look in particular how those workers would link in with voluntary organisations who are in touch with more uh, marginalised and excluded groups of the population. So we, we had a good conversation about that and I think that we'll, we'll see how that uh, develops in the, uh, in the thinking around the plan. I mean, I think, to be honest, I think that the, the impact of, of work by VCSE groups with those people that are at the Sharp and Inverse Care Law 
isn't just about link workers, it's about how we design public um, health in those places such that we can actually manage demand better. An example I keep giving is one from my own organisation where I know that in two or three areas my clients are going to be the ones turning up at A&E in winter, um, largely because we've yet to actually engage fully with the system in order to assist in the management of demand. So just adding to what uh, Neil said to thank Victor for his leadership on this, but I think it's not just a process. I think there are some, to state the obvious, some very important substantive questions which have arisen from this. And I just wanted to give one example, which is referenced in the in Appendix 2, the letter of the 23rd of October, which has now played into one of the big debates we're still having in the long-term plan, actually, around frailty. And what this work kind of really, I think, has triggered a big conversation about is... Frailty, obviously, through a lens of supporting older people, is a big move towards, uh, you know, it's identified in care of the uh, elderly medicine, previously known as geriatrics, as a kind of a, a, a thing, a concept in its own right. But what this has, I think, pointed out to is actually uh, there are many people who are frail who aren't elderly. Uh, secondly, actually labelling people frail is a very disempowering term that actually people don't like. And thirdly, we should probably be conceptualising this as high need, of whom in some areas many will be frail, not all of whom will be elderly, rather than using frailty per se as the way of encapsulating a new, more activist community health model. So really it was that, it was your uh, sort of challenge which has triggered all of that uh, debate amongst the many partners in forming the long-term plan, and which we you know, need to uh, conclude on uh, very shortly. So thank you for that as well. I think this also relates to Carrie's comment earlier around demedicalizing care. I think this, it's really striking how when you look at uh, how we connect the NHS to wider societal support, there's actually a huge enthusiasm that's being led by the profession. Actually, so the biggest advocates of kind of social prescribing or referral models at the moment are the Royal College of GPs. Um, just, um, I think just picking up Noel's point is what there is something really powerful about not only the work that we've done nationally but also what happens at a local level and actually having uh, people that work in the voluntary sector that actually look after each other and support communities is really important um, and you and I were talking earlier we've got Bren in the audience who actually leads this in Gloucestershire in a significant way that's one example where um, having communities supporting each other and actually looking after the most vulnerable and enabling them to live their lives and get the best outcomes is a really important thing. So we look at it nationally, do the work we've done nationally led by Victor and, and Michelle in the task force, but also we need to remember that actually to make the difference on the ground, we need to have we need to link into those that deliver it day in, day out. And the use of the voluntary sector and, the, and social prescribing, as Ian's just pointed out, I think is a really powerful way of doing that and has really significant outcomes. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, just echo what Jane said, because Bren is in the audience over there. You know, we had a, had a day in Parliament two weeks ago just seeing what, you, what people can do in their local communities. It's, it is very powerful and, and very inspirational, actually. Um, right, moving on to something less inspirational, um, sort of finance and performance. <laughs> um, Matthew. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I, um, I'd like to start by um, drawing the board's attention. As you read through the paper, which gives you kind of, kind of all the breakdown of performance o over the last month and the comparisons of the last year, what I'd, what I'd like to just pull out is, is the theme that's coming through here is the extent to which services are being redesigned, that pathways are being uh, redesigned and the patient experience is, is changing. So I, I just thought I'd join some of those up for you. Um, in, um, in elective care, we've seen uh, GP referrals have risen um, uh, this year by 0.2%. Um, um, last year, they actually fell compared to the year before. If you were to go back two or three years, you'd find that the, the GP referrals were going up 4 or 5% every year. Um, that 
doesn't happen by magic. That's, that's happened because of um, a series of innovations in primary care to be able to manage patients closer to home, closer to primary care, and not require everyone to go into outpatients. So, for example, for musculoskeletal uh, services, we've now in uh, 178 CCGs, we, have, we now have MSK triage services, in the CCGs that have put those in place, we have seen a 10% reduction in uh, referrals into, into orthopedics out, uh, orthopedic outpatients. Um, that ties in with, uh, we now have 12 specialty handbooks dis distributed ad ad addressing how to redesign care around particular specialties. And we've got first, uh, first contact practitioners across primary care now managing patients close to, to, to their home and, and relieving the burden of hospital. Um, in, uh, in the emergency care setting, um, you'll see in the numbers um, a 4.3% overall increase in, uh, in, in A&E attendances. When you look below the surface on that, that's a less than 2% growth in what we call type 1 A&E, that's uh, actual hospital A&E is what the public would consider to be a hospital A&E, and an 11% growth in the use of urgent treatment centres, minor injuries units and walk-in centres, which have been a specific focus of our development over the last couple of years to create those alternate pathways um, to care, keeping people away from A&E so that A&Es can focus on the patients who actually need to be there. Um, 111 has, uh, as our uh, telephone uh, d uh, based service, has saw, uh, took 1.3 million calls last month. That's a nearly 6% increase on uh, the same month last year, of which over half of them got to speak to a clinician. The patients got to speak to a clinician. That's a 10% increase on the position last year. So increasingly, 111 is able to solve people's problems, uh, not just direct them to, a, to, a, to another service. And we now have an online app-based version of that available across the country, and in two-thirds of the country that's uh, fully integrated into the 111 services we will get to um, to, to the whole of the country um, our digital services we've seen uh, two and a half million uh, more visits to the NHS website this year compared to the same period last year we've had 620,000 visits to the app library where we have 75 apps um, and another 120 going through approval processes to help people manage their own care um, and we have a, uh, what will become a ubiquitous NHS app is now uh, in testing with 30 GP practices to roll out across the country. And then when we look at people in the hospital, we've seen um, a reduction in delayed transfers of care um, this year of um, 792 beds. Uh, that's a 14% reduction and a reduction in the number of patients in hospital for over 21 days of 13%. Uh, That's releasing nearly 2,500 beds back into the hospital sector for, uh, to care for people. And the total number of occupied bed days uh, uh, has fallen by 1.5%. So there's a whole raft now going on across the whole of the country in all sectors, which are saying you don't have to suck everybody into hospital. There are ways of caring for people using digital technology, using the telephone, using primary care in different ways to keep people away. And I, and I think that's tell, uh, when we see the long-term plan come out, we will see that story um, will be writ through it about how, how do we become preventative, how do we become close to the communities, how do we keep people away from becoming an inpatient admission. Um, in terms of performance, um, A&E performance uh, in the last month was at 89.1%. Uh, That's up from 88.9% uh, in the previous month. Um, we've seen ambulance uh, performance continue to improve against the new standards. Um, elective uh, waiting lists, um, the uh, compliance with the uh, 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 with the 18-week uh, standard uh, fell from 87.2% in August to 80 uh, sorry 87.2% in August to 86.7% in September. There's a big focus at the moment on long waiters. We set a target of halving the number of people who waited over 52 weeks. That's going in the wrong direction at the moment. So there is very close focus, hospital by hospital. We are still focused on delivering that. That that, um, that halving of the number of, of long waiters before the end of the year. Um, in primary care, we will we've brought forward the uh, improving access, extended access for primary care uh, objective to this side of Christmas in order to support this winter. And we're currently at 98% of the country, 98% of the population has access to extended hours um, primary care. Um, GP trainees, we 
uh, set a target of an extra 3,250 trainees. Uh, we've actually managed to recruit 3,473, so that's a 10% increase on last year. Um, we are we've virtually hit the increase of 5,000 in primary care staff growth that we were aiming for, um, and we are on track to invest uh, 800 million pounds more in primary care uh, technology and estate over five years. Um, we are still struggling with our ambition to add 5,000 GPs. Um, there's a considerable work going on around improving GP retention, um, uh, reducing the workload for GPs and encouraging people to come back into the workforce who, uh, who stepped out of it, uh, as well as, um, as, as our international recruitment. Um, and in mental health, um, we are on track to ensure that 100% of CCGs meet the mental health investment standard this year, 90% last year, 85% the year before. Um, and in cancer, um, we are struggling uh, around the 62-day target. We have seen a 13.6% increase in demand uh, uh, this year. There's been a 10.7% uh, increase in activity, in cancer activity. So big increase in demand, big increase in activity, but the consequence of that is that we are moving away from the 85% uh, cancer target, 62-day target, not towards it. Um, we've invested another uh, £10 million in increasing capacity in cancer across the country in order to try and get that back under control. It is an uh, an anomaly in the way in which we count the waiting times that as we deal with patients who've waited too long, the performance figures will get worse before they get better. But that, but we are there's very close engagement now. Um, in fact, the reason I will be pre presenting the winter uh, uh, target uh, pr uh, report shortly, not Neil Pomain, is that uh, he is out as part of a team going and visiting every cancer centre to talk through what they're doing in order to recover the cancer target. So, um, considerable work going on, and I will, with your permission, I'll stop for any questions, and then I'll move on to just to talk about specifically what we're doing on winter. Please. On, on, on cancer, Yes. Um, could you just give us a bit, bit more sort of a slightly more granular on the sort of cancer sites? You know, where because I think it's mainly a lot around a lot of the issue and the extra demands around prostate. I think. Yes. Just, just give a bit of a view on that, could you? Uh, do you? Uh, so, thank you. Um, a bit of agreement is helpful. Um, the uh, it, it's a, it's over a number of, uh, of of cancers, but but the most dramatic increase has been. Uh, around prostate cancer or around uh, urological referrals, um, that, is, uh, that is good news. Uh, it, the extent that it's, the bad news is it's taken us by surprise that it should increase so much so quickly. So we're stumbling a bit to respond to demand, but, uh, but we, are, we need to identify cancers earlier, which means people need to come forward with their symptoms earlier in order that we can get them through the diagnostic process and identify. And there's been a very large spike um, in, uh, in people coming forward with uh, urological um, concerns, what they call query cancer, concerns that they might have uh, cancer. Interestingly, um, the numbers of cancers that we are identifying in the increase are proportionally not wholly dissimilar to the numbers that we were seeing in the previous cohort. So these are not wasted appointments. We are still finding cancers that wouldn't have been diagnosed uh, uh, if those patients hadn't come forward. So. We, whilst I talk about demand management in other areas and making sure the right patients come forward, I don't talk about demand management in cancer. We need to identify more, get them treated more quickly in order to improve our outcomes. That means the challenge, therefore, is on us to be able to deal with the capacity as the public get the message. We need to be able to step up and um, responding to uh, uh, the uh, a nearly 14% growth in demand with a nearly 11% growth in, uh, uh, in capacity. Is, is, a, is a pretty impressive response by the NHS, but it's not as big an increase in capacity as the demand increase has been. Steve, as much. Is the 62-day waiting time target as appropriate for prostate cancer as it is for other cancers? Um, so the prostate pathway is a pathway in which there is a fair amount of treatment choice. 
uh, including in some patients um, watchful waiting type uh, approach rather than intervention approach. So it is true that um, the feedback that we've had from clinicians is that if we were to examine one of the pathways to test whether uh, the 62-day pathway works um, well in individual pathways. Prostate would be the one to test. And the cancer team are indeed at the moment with their clinical um, advisors looking uh, at, that exa at exactly that question to, to look to see whether the prostate pathway uh, within the 62-day uh, uh, target um, is... Uh, is set as appropriately as it should be to take into account the clinical uh, c the, the clinical nuances in that pathway. I think it, I think the thing it, the thing we have to ask is is the mix of cancers changing? Because yeah. the reason we have an eighty five percent target is to reflect that some we should be doing better on. So dermatology and breast performance is around ninety percent. Um, so the idea the clinical appropriateness was some would be much quicker, some would be a, be a lower performance. So eighty five percent reflects that. But if the number of prostate patients goes up disproportionately to the others, then the average that was calculated previously becomes inappropriate. And there is a risk that patients are being pushed into receiving treatments, which actually patient choice would be watchful waiting. So, yeah. so we need to be really smart about that. So, so the direction of travel will undoubtedly be, as Matthew has said, towards maximising early diagnosis. <laughs> Uh, so the direction of travel within cancer will be to, to diagnose as quickly as possible uh, and then after every diagnosis, uh, as Carrie actually highlighted in the discussion we had on evidence-based interventions, uh, and, and it is as true in cancer as it is in any other uh, condition, and prostate is a very good example of this, to then have a, a shared decision uh, type discussion with patients as to most appropriate treatment. Clearly, it's also important that treatment is then done in a in a reasonable time. Uh, but actually, what we increasingly want, for reasons that we have described, uh, is to is to maximise the is to, is to focus on getting a diagnosis as early as possible, and that is both around encouraging patients to come forward, which is the story behind prostate, which we discussed at the last board around the publicity around prostate cancer earlier in the year, but also then to have our pathways to be able to make the diagnosis as quickly as possible. Any questions? Okay. Um, I just wanted to echo a theme in this paper, which Matthew alluded to, um, because I think it's important and summarized well which is um, the big, we're, how we're beginning to see the waterfall of digital offers coming through. And the reason why that's important is because we spent the last year building, last two years, building the tracks on which these trains run mm -hmm. um, to some of the highest levels of resilience and some of the most important national infrastructure of the NHS. And now the trains are being delivered. What's pleasing about it is, one, the take-up rates are really positive. Mm -hmm. The adoption rates in different areas of clinical and patient practice are also very positive. And I think patients will begin to see that what we have created in the back office for the last two years and now allows us to put some compelling digital offers into the patient-facing routes, which we haven't really had before. The reason why that matters is because I think we should be quite encouraged about what we're going to then propose in the long-term plan in terms of further enhancements and development of the digital offer, which will make a real choice available to different cohorts of patients over the next three to four years. I think that's a, a comment rather than a question, I think, isn't it? It was an echo of a theme. Which, <laughs> <laughs> which I wholly agree with. Yeah. Yeah. Just a question. <coughs> I'm sure that we're doing this, but the notion of uh, tracking who, what, where in relation to the digital app, um, it seems to me to be quite an important piece of work. Are we, are, we, are we doing that or have we started doing it so that we are kind of evaluating as we go in terms of, you know, inequalities, impact, that kind of, who uses this stuff? What it really costs. Yes, so on the, on the digital uh, uh, relevant, we, we do a lot of work on who's using the systems, where are they using them, how long do they use them for, do the, 
are they having a look and walking away or are they going mm. through them? so, so we, we, we're gathering a, a lot of, of, of that data it's not something I think it's a um, it's a world that the NHS has not been in very well in the, in the past and I think on, on the digital solutions we're much further advanced than we have in, 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 in some in some other areas and there are uh, a raft of specific uh, 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 digital access programs that are being run in hard to reach communities oh, as part that, of yeah. this as well <clears throat> both um, some uh, uh, some very economically poor communities and ethnic mm. diverse communities and community so so that there are specific programs running around around the country to try and make sure we, d we address issues of, d of digital divide and learn from those in terms of how, how to build solutions that are uh, appropriate for the technology that people have access to and the lives that they have that they live because in a way that would be the thing that it's not for me to say but it'd be interesting for the board to see the systemic impacts of these interventions so that it can think about yeah. what this forward strategy looks like um, yeah i mean i spent i'd be i'd be fascinated to see yesterday that afternoon the with yeah. the uh president of the royal college of psychiatry talking mm. about how digital technology can be used to support patients with mental health mm. problems mm. It, um, you can move on to winter. Yes, thank you. So, as you'll be aware, we <coughs> published. A, well, first of all, apologies from, from from Pauline and Neil, who've both got better offers than this. But uh, I, I'm delighted to step in for them. Um, the you'll be aware that the um, uh, our winter review of last year was published back in September. Um, its conclusion was really that the careful preparation and tremendous efforts from frontline staff meant that despite the fact that we were hit by um, the worst flu in, uh, in seven years, um, more patients, people were seen and uh, either admitted or treated and discharged within four hours than ever before. Um, and I think... Um, my personal view is, is that the upshot of all of that preparation and effort meant that whilst it got bumpy through winter, the NHS stayed on its feet, continued to deliver high quality care and, and handled winter. If we hadn't been that well prepared, flu could have put us in a very difficult, in a very different place. Um, and if we hadn't had the flu, what we would have seen was a significant Im uh, in improvement in A&E performance last winter. So, um, and and I, so I think the winter review get, gave that kind of view. Coming into this year, there's been a continued um, focus on <clears throat> uh, throughout um, the summer running into the autumn on working with the most underperforming trusts um, to uh, uh, to try and uh, improve their performance making sure that we have GP out of hours um, uh, and winter cover uh, properly in place making sure that GP streaming is in place in every A&E um, making sure that, that 111 is able to handle the, the new volumes and provide the right levels of clinical contact and, and really uh, continuing to roll out the urgent and emergency care strategy and the integrated urgent care strategies that we've had for the last couple of years and I think there have been uh, there's been a real advantage in having a strategy which we have enhanced each year as opposed to publishing an, a whole new strategy every year there is a consistency to them to, to the model um, as we look at winter going forward, uh, kind of coming rapidly towards us now, you look at the winter it's kind of, window, it's kind of here. Um, we, have, um, we have a more effect, effective flu vaccine than we had last year. Um, we saw an increase of 5% in the number of, of NHS staff who were vaccinated last year. We have a big focus on getting NHS staff vaccinated this year a whole new set of requirements I think we have raised the level of expectation quite significantly we have some organizations that are doing spectacularly well and and, and get the vast majority of their staff vaccinated and then other organizations who do pitifully and we do need to see every organization step up and do the right thing for their staff and for their patients and, yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, and so th I think that's critical to us but in terms of the public um, we have uh, all of the vaccine that we're expecting to be delivered has been delivered. It's been delivered as was planned and as primary care and pharmacists knew. Um, 
there, uh, the, the noise about vaccine shortages we dealt with by making sure that we knew exactly where all the vaccines were all over the country. In some places we moved vaccines around, but we now have all of the vaccine out there. In fact, we have uh, a million more doses of vaccine now in the NHS than we, than we gave to people last year. So that there is no reason why we shouldn't see, uh, uh, why, why anybody shouldn't be able to get access, access to the vaccine. We would urge people now now, if you haven't been uh, had your vaccine and you're part of one of our risk and vulnerable groups, now is the moment to get. To, uh, it's the moment to go forwards. Um, we've had a <clears throat> the the focus for this year's winter plan has been. Uh, uh, probably the single biggest part of it has been on beds. It's been on, is there the capacity to create um, enough, um, a, a low enough bed occupancy level that we can create flow through, uh, through, through hospitals? Um, we set out to try and release um, 4,000 beds through a reduction in, uh, in long-stay patients. We've released about two and a half thousand so far. So the focus has to continue on that, uh, uh, on that in order to continue to say patients who are inappropriately in hospital and will be better cared for somewhere else. Let's get the packages of care where they're provided by social care, where they're provided by the NHS, in place so we can get them to a better location in order to create the space in our hospitals so that people who need to be admitted can be, can be admitted. Um, and uh, we need also to ensure that. Beds that have been closed in hospitals over the summer are now opened going into winter. We need, um, we have seen a bit of an inclination of as uh, as uh, length of stay have come down, as beds of hospitals become more efficient. Some of those beds have been being closed behind them. We now need to get those beds open. That we, we the NHS need, needs uh, need to that capacity. Um, we've invested uh, 145 million uh, pounds in A and E's in creating extra bed capacity and creating facilities for. Um, same day A and E treatment or A and E day cases. One of the big expansions that we've seen this year is uh, it is in particular pathways where patients can be managed in A and E and discharged the same day, rather than um, being admitted to a, to a ward, frequently an elderly care ward, where it might then take you two or three or four days to get them back discharged. And uh, say from my, my, my personal family experience is that when that's done well, it works really, really well. Um, so we're seeing that across the, uh, across the country. We're also working very closely with our colleagues in social care um, to ensure that the £240 million that has been put into social care to, to, to fund uh, staffing and packages of care in order to ensure that people aren't inappropriately in hospital is spent well and effectively and is actually creating that, that flow through, uh, through hospital. Um, we're confident that we will have the extended access to primary care in place. Um, we are confident that we are uh, uh, building the capacity in 111 to continue to manage the sort of growth that, that we've seen. Um, but there's a very close level of scrutiny now. We have, uh, uh, we have somebody overseeing uh, the winter plan delivery in each of the regions as, as their full-time job. And Pauline and her team are doing a series of calls over the next two weeks. So 92 trusts um, and their associated CCG accountable officers, so this is chief executives and accountable officers, will be walking through with Pauline and her team exactly what they now have in place for winter, what needs to be done over the next couple of weeks, and how, we, how we're going to make sure that we run through from this point now through to sort of mid-February how, how is this go, how is this going to be delivered um, and out of that identify those trusts or those CCGs that need more help from uh, uh, from NHS England and NHSI in order in, in order to make sure we get the delivery right but the uh, um, I think it's be fair to say that uh, 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 Pauline Phillips is person marking every single A&E department across the country now all right thanks very much Richard just a, a quick question on the 240 million social care yep. money, because we, we have had a problem in the past with making best use of monies that come out relatively late in the day. Can you yep. say a little bit about how that money is being used and how convinced we are about the effectiveness of that? Um, well, I, I think the first thing to say is, is that relationships between health and social care are, are spectacularly better now than they probably were a couple of years ago, that the, the, the work over the last couple of years couple of years does mean that there um, and as I travel around the country and talk to STPs there's um, almost always so um, 
I was in uh, I was up in Huddersfield last Friday and the Calderdale and Huddersfield directors of adult social care were in the room with the chief executive of the local hospital and the account officers for the CCG so that is now much more the norm um, so I, th I think there's much more a sense of partnership of us being in this uh, together notwithstanding that we are expecting um, uh, regions and CCGs to ensure that this money does turn into actual packages of care for real people in order to, to deliver the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the flow through. Um, and uh, we will know whether it works or not. But that's, uh, but, but that's a, uh, I think that's a it's, a, it's a local management piece and part of what Pauline and the, and, and the emergency care team are doing is saying mm -hmm. so. So what is that doing? Is it actually moving real patients from inappropriate hospital beds into appropriate packages of care in their own home? Any other questions for Matthew? Well, there's a lot going on, Matthew. Very um, Well, thank you very much anyway yes. for that report. Many thanks. So, Matt, finance. Thank you. Um, so the chairman, the paper, uh, before the board uh, reflects the year-to-date and forecast position at month six, 2018-19. Uh, um, uh, as reported at the September board meeting, uh, the commissioning sector um, has revised its uh, plan uh, and is planning to deliver an underspend of 265 million uh, for 1819. Um, and our year-to-date performance and our uh, full-year forecast uh, at the end of month six is broadly in line with that. Um, uh, within that, sort of under the bonnet, as it were, um, there were 36 CCGs with a year-to-date overspend. Um, uh, those are largely driven by um, overspends on acute contracts, um, uh, and those are offset by underspends within our direct commissioning budgets and with our, within NHS England's central budgets. Uh, and we're expecting, um, at month six, we're expecting all bar uh, 11 uh, of those um, 36 CCGs to um, bring their uh, full year position um, in line with plan um, by the end of the year. Um, uh, the, I mentioned the central budgets were uh, offsetting some uh, overspends um, in CCGs. Uh, that's largely driven by uh, a combination of vacancies, um, some unexpected income from GP rates, rebates, um, counter fraud receipts, um, and uh, similar small items. Um, I will, um, as I said, the paper reflects the position at month six. Um, uh, since the papers were prepared, uh, we have, uh, as we always do at this point of the year, uh, conducted a sort of thorough but routine review of our central budget in order to identify any possible uh, further underspends um, and to give um, uh, you an update on that um, in this meeting. Um, uh, t taking those um, further likely underspends in central budgets, um, combining those with our overall assessment of risk um, uh, out in the system and our ability to manage that, um, and indeed taking account of some of the items that have been discussed uh, earlier on in the meeting, both around the timely conclusion of the PPRS deal and the successful uh, procurement around um, biosimilar uh, medicines. Um, we think that for uh, month seven, we'll be able to release uh, a number of further reserves and contingencies into the reported position. Um, and taking those together uh, with the position on direct uh, commissioning and updated forecasts of performance against the quality premium, uh, we, we would expect to be um, uh, in our next report um, forecasting a year-end uh, underspend of at least 450 million. Thank you. Normally, when you have your the new finance director, comes up with bad news, but it seems to be going the right way this time. So. Thank you for that. Any questions, Dave? You got just, a question? Just one, um, Matt. The, uh, your your confidence in the CCG forecasts. You've done your usual sort of scrubbing of, sort of numbers and so on. But um, is there much downside risk within there, or are you comfortable? Um, uh, I, I mean, I think our regions, in particular, um, have done a very thorough uh, deep dive um, over the month, month five, month six period in order to increase our confidence. Um, in those in those forecasts, um, clearly there, there is risk uh, in the position, and as I say, particularly reflected in um, uh, particularly reflected in the um, acute contracting position and, the, and, and volume risk there. Uh, at the same time, um, we have worked hard to identify mitigation, so that I'm confident we'll be able to deliver the position as reflected okay. in the 
yeah. um, in the month six okay. forecast. Thanks very much. So on the, the next item, which is governance, I think we've got reports from the various board committees. I don't think there's any issues arising from them. Is there, has anyone got any issues they wanted to raise on those? Um, thank you. I think we're on to any other business. Um, I'd just like to say a few words um, about Victor, because Victor can't come to the board event um, this evening, so no one will be saying anything about him then. So I, I thought well, I'd just... Well. Well. <laughs> 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 so I made these predictions. <laughs> please, please, people, feel free. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I've known Victor for, I think, about four years, and it was a, actually it was a meeting in the House of Lords when I was at the CQC where I, I first met Victor. And I think... If there were two things where Victor, and there are many, many more things, but two things where I think Victor has made um, a real difference to, to the NHS over the last, and this is looking at it from the outside in, in my case. The first would be around the, the workforce race equality standard and raising the whole, I can put it, rather, well, issue of, of the sort of the lack of inclusion of people from BME backgrounds in senior positions in the NHS, which is a huge issue and I and I think really it's almost a metaphor for the lack of inclusion throughout the NHS that we can do so much better in this area and if we can crack the BME issue then we'll crack every other issue um, in our in the sort of workforce culture within the NHS and so you've done a uh, you know, a huge amount in that area and I hope you'll carry on doing that you know working with Yvonne and, and others the second is well actually and I would say that in terms of the, the arguments for diversity, I mean, the role that you've played on this board is sort of living proof of that, that you, you'll never get groupthink if Victor is, on the, is in the group. Um, it is that mixture of sort of iconoclastic, irreverent um, behavior coupled with that sort of moral authority that you bring to it from your own background at Turning Point and all the work you've done before. And so I think the second area where you've made a huge impact is on never letting go of the issues around inequalities, you know, making the case that actually the moral case for the NHS is not about solving inequalities or reducing inequalities, then there is no moral case for the NHS. And I think putting that on the table all the time, and I think we'll see it reflected very strongly in the 10-year plan, is another huge tribute and reflection of the, of the value you've, you've brought to, um, to this board and to the NHS more widely. Just on a slightly humorous note, I'm just ending. I remember when Victor told me when he went to the committee about whether or not he should go into the House of Lords or not. He was asked, <laughs> why do you want to be in the House of Lords? And he replied, well, free car parking in central London, which <laughs> tells you something about the irreverence of... Uh, but also, you know, because it's not true. Because you know, immediately that is not true in Nixon's case, because actually what he wanted to do was bring uh, the voice of people from his background right to the centre of sort of government thinking and government policy. And you've done that in spades. Uh, Victor, if I may say so. So, um, on behalf of all of us and, and this board, uh, a huge thank you for what you've done, and and I'm sure you'll you'll carry on making a contribution in different guises in the future, Victor. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. So, I think we now have a resolution to move to a private um, private part of the board, which we'll do. So, thank you, everyone who's come to come today. Thank you.